Realm presents The Villa Salvation, Episode 1. Leave the guilty behind. That was the initiative Nico had believed in. Their rallying cry, their purpose for all the shit they pulled themselves through to find the star drive. To get to the other side of that wormhole. To find a new life. But then the guilty were left behind. Nico and everyone else in this galaxy were left behind. And as the wormholes closed, they looked on with the certain resignation of someone staring into the vast black void and seeing nothingness staring back. Hope was gone. The Vela was gone. As was their solar system's last chance at survival. The sun was dying and its planet slowly freezing over, succumbing to that ineffable darkness. And soon, all of the people that called Hypatia and Gonda and Kayam and Quarizmi and even Camp Gala, suspended in a forever rotation around Gonda, home, would succumb to that darkness, too. It had been six months since the evac, since the wormhole closed and all hope was lost. Six months since the guilty were left behind. Nico hadn't understood why Asala didn't get their reasoning. But now they knew all too well. Because only fools judge someone else's worthiness. Who were they to decide who deserved to live and who deserved to die? Nico wanted to die. Back pressed against a cold and rigid crate of warm sywool coats and blankets bound for Gonda, the sound of pulse pistols echoing in the cargo hull, Nico wanted to die. The Marauder-class freighter, the Marooned, as it was ironically named, had been saved for three weeks, two days, and 19 hours. Six. Six shots. There were six shots in a pulse rifle before the clip had to reload. Six shots bore into the other side of the crate. Nico held tight to the pistol, squeezed their eyes shut, and dove out from behind the crate. A Gonda soldier shouted, There they are! Capture them! We've orders not to kill! Another reminded. Nico ducked behind another crate and cursed. Orders not to kill their ass! If these soldiers didn't want to kill them, then they should have used sleep darts or a trank gun or anything besides live ammunition. Nano splints could heal wounds, not gaping holes in someone's chest. Nico checked the ship's blueprints on their personal data pad. The engine room should be down the corridor to their left, and that meant the lab was straight ahead. Nico had spent the better part of two months looking for this damned ship. Two months scouring through data trails and docking manifests to find something, anything, that the scientist Uzochi Ryota left behind. Blueprints for the star drive, anything, literally anything, would do. Nico prayed to the gods and darted for the door just ahead of the soldiers. A bullet whizzed past their ear so close they felt the burn scorch their cheek. Ten feet. Five Stop them! Don't let them get a- Nico slammed their hand against the panel to close the door, and it slid shut with a hiss. Then they ripped the panel off the wall, hoping that stalled the Ganda soldiers for at least a few minutes. They doubled over to catch their breath, and finally turned into the room. It was a lab, dust-covered and derelict, but a lab nonetheless. Tears almost came to Nico's eyes. Their information had been right. They had tracked the ship to a port in the Ganda region of Zaroa in the southern hemisphere. The scientist Uzochi had taken up residence here when she first came to Ganda, and only stayed for a few weeks, long enough to set up a small lab and do some work before relocating. Nico had been to almost every forsaken inner ring planet looking for this very ship. Most of the lab equipment seemed to have been packed up in a hurry, and any computer left had been scrubbed. But they took out a small thumb drive from their inner pocket and pressed it into one of the ports. 
A data worm spread through the scrubbed computer, digging into every hole, every module, every program, searching for any trace of history or backlogs. Though with every second, Nico's heart felt heavier and heavier. What if the only blueprints were with Uzochi? On the other side of the wormhole? What if there weren't any traces? What if everyone here was stuck, fated to starve to death, or freeze, or... A window popped up on the screen, and Nico couldn't enter the command to open the files quick enough. Please, 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 they prayed to whatever gods were out there. If the gods were listening, if the gods were real, they weren't going to just surrender now. A bloom of data flowered across the screen. Coordinates. Coordinates to a distant star. A distant solar system. Not what Nico was looking for, but for the first time in six dark months, since they stared out into the nothingness, they felt... a spark. It wasn't quite hope. It tasted bitter. But it was there. And it was growing. They were quickly queuing up the program to download every last code and scrap of data the worm could find when a laser cutter punctured the door. They whirled around, startled. No. They couldn't download the coordinates. If they did, then the Ganda soldiers would capture them, find it, and do... Uh, who knew what? No. This information was best left lost to everyone else. Nico turned back toward the screen and with renewed concentration committed the coordinates to memory. They weren't very good at fighting. They were shit at mechanics. But code, numbers and signs all neatly filed in a row? They knew those quite well. So they stored the information in the back part of their brain where they usually shoved the grief for their dead father and then deleted the coordinates. Wiped the entire memory. And then, for good measure, they took the pulse pistol out of its holster and shot the hard drive dead. The soldiers had cut through the door by then and kicked it in. The door fell with a heavy thump, and the sound of footsteps rushed in. The click of fingers on the triggers of pistols. The heavy breaths of drones would chased Nico across the stars, all the way here. And they had finally caught up. Surinda, one of the soldiers, the one in charge, Nico presumed, commanded. Surinda, and we'll let you live. Aren't your orders to bring me in alive? Nico asked, quite unable to stop themselves. They turned around, and as they did, the butt of a rifle slammed down against their face, knocking them out cold. There was coldness in the distance, screaming. The whirl of spaceships chatter through their headset. Nico knew this dream, this memory of the evac. They had it often. It was home in the same way that loneliness was home now, too. Watching the wormholes spread wide against the vast darkness, yawning open like giant mouths into the great unknown. They had had a chance to go, they remembered. They had a chance to board a ship and make it through the line of imposing Kayami starships and Ganda marauders into that great unknown. But people had needed them in the control room on Camp Gala as the space station fell apart around them. Asala had needed them, and they were foolish enough to want to earn back her trust. So they stayed. Never mind that. It didn't matter. In that control room panel, they watched the lights of the starships blink, blink, blink. And then one went out. Their father's starship. They had stared at the screen, waiting for the light to come back. For the ship to just have lost contact for a moment. For... for something else beside the inevitable. But there was only Asala's light swirling away from where their father's ship had been. And they knew. Asala had killed their father. 
And then she left into the closing wormhole, without a word, without a reason, without Nico. Leaving Nico without anyone at all. Nico woke with a start. Their head was spinning. The smell of the command station in Camp Gala, acidic steel and rust, filled their nose. The ghost of a smell. The memory of a refugee camp that was no longer there. It had been disbanded a few days after the evac. Ganda forces stormed what was left of the camp, took the refugees prisoner, and brought everyone planet side. The refugees were branded criminals for having housed Uzochi Ryota, who had escaped into the wormhole with countless people. No one had an accurate record. A hundred people could have gone through the wormhole, or a hundred thousand. And there was no telling. They shook their head and sat up on the hard bed, getting their bearings. It wasn't a prison cell, at least, but it wasn't exactly a five-star resort, either. The bed was bare, and there was a bathroom and sink, but that was all. It must have been a room on one of Ganda's larger warships. The only one they had seen was the Thorn, General Sinrig's own gargantuan warship. But the last Nico had heard, that had gone toward the wormhole as well. They wondered how many warmongering ships the Gandesians had. Probably hundreds. Enough to take the rest of the star system. They had already set up warships around Kaim, the planet Nico's father had been president of. And without a leader, the planet had shuddered itself, reeling from the loss. Nico was simply waiting for the news that the Ganda military had invaded. It doesn't matter, they thought. You aren't a president's child anymore. Their father was dead, and his title along with it. Pushing themselves to sit up, their head began to throb, so they slumped back against the wall their bed was pushed up against. They could feel the nano splints working on the gash on the side of their face, slowly knitting the skin back together. The nano splints hurt more than they normally did. Whoever had clocked them on the jaw really did a number. Then again, it was probably the same soldier who had followed them across the stars for the last three months. So Nico couldn't really fault them. Nico knew what the Gandesian Empire wanted. As the child of the late President Ekram of Kayam, Nico might have just been the only one who could negotiate peace between Kayam and Gunda. They had two brothers, but they highly doubted either Lucas or Anta would even consider negotiations. Neither of their brothers had ever been the sit-and-listen type. Nico had taken the reins on that one. So it only made sense that Ganda wanted to deal with Nico and not their act-first-listen-later brothers. Besides, Nico was at the evac when it happened. If Kayam had to choose which of President Ekram's children to listen to, it would be the one who was there, who saw what happened, who watched Asala, assassin and friend, kill their father. Don't think about it, Nico told themselves. Instead, they summoned up the memory of the coordinates, repeating the numbers like a mantra, a story, a prayer. They kept the coordinates fresh in their head because while it wasn't blueprints to another star drive, it was something. It was more than what Nico had found in three months of searching, and they wouldn't under any circumstances, let it pass them by. A few hours later, a Gandesian soldier brought them what looked like dinner and expressed surprise that they were awake already. Apparently, the doctor who looked at Nico had thought they would be out for a few more hours at least. If nothing else, Nico surprised people. The general will be pleased to know you're alive, the soldier said with a distinct accent. My passion? Upper Crescent. Nico knew that tongue. Asala's voice was tinged with it, too. Nico knew that after the evac, most of the refugees left at Camp Gala were conscripted into the military. But Nico hadn't really paid much attention until now. It had all been facts they had heard but never seen. 
It was different seeing it for themselves. Something in what the soldiers said caught their attention. General, who's the new acting commander now that Sinrig is gone? There isn't one, said a cold, crisp voice from the doorway. Nico stared up at the shadowy figure in the entrance. Their skin prickled. At first, they tried to convince themselves that their eyes deceived them. It couldn't be. But then the woman stepped into the brightly lit room, her silvery white hair pulled back into a tight bun, cheekbones sharp enough to cut glass, in a simple black uniform and boots. But her eyes, her eyes Nico remembered the best. Dark, cold, and emotionless, like the nothingness that stared back from the emptiness of space. It couldn't be. Nico had seen her warship, the Thorn, heading toward the gaping maw of the wormhole. They had seen it go. But there was no denying that General Sinrig stood in their room, very much real and very much a problem. And that only meant one thing. The Thorn hadn't been fast enough. The General's warship hadn't made it in time. And now this cruel woman and her military might were stuck here on the back side of the rift with every other guilty party. Nico found themselves smiling despite themselves. Well, this is a surprise. The general raised a single thin eyebrow. What is? You here? Last I saw you, you were fleeing into the wormhole. The general backhanded Nico so hard across the face, they felt the sting in their teeth. Blood came to their tongue. Yes, it's a sore subject. You should hold your tongue before you spit lies, child. Child. Nico was far from that. At 26, they felt 30 years older than when they first left their home on Kyum, bound for some greater purpose with the Order of Boreas. How laughable that was. They'd been through too much. They didn't want to go through anything else. A small voice in their head said, Maybe if you push her, she'll kill you. The thought surprised Nico. They'd never thought about suicide, but they felt numb to it now. The word had been a sharp knife in their mind before, no, it was just a dull scratch. They wondered what their father would say about that. Probably condemn it. No, they knew he would condemn it. But their father wasn't here anymore. Their father had no more words left to give Nico. Their last conversation with their father had been a confrontation. Nico had replayed the scene over and over in their head, what they said, what they could have said differently, what they could have changed to, to save him. Could they have saved him? If they had, maybe General Sinrig wouldn't have held them captive in an undisclosed location on some begotten fleet ship left to her machinations. The general took a chair from the desk on the other side of the room, pulled it up to the bed, and sat down. Now, are we going to talk like civilized adults? You just called me a child, so I don't have a lot of hope. The old woman frowned. Perhaps if you quit acting like one, I wouldn't refer to you as such. Sorry if I don't believe you. Again, the general backhanded Nico across the face. The taste of blood flooded their mouth. The nano-splint that had been working on the gash on the back of their head was slowly but surely making its way to their tongue and bloody lip. Now, what were you doing on that derelict ship? Nico ran their tongue across their bloodied lip. It stung. Looking, they ground out. For what? Things. General Sinrig raised her hand again, and despite themselves, Nico winced bracing for the slap. But the general stopped herself and leaned back in the chair. I'm a patient sort. If you won't tell me now, you will soon. I always get what I want. 
You didn't get through that wormhole, did you? Nico knew they shouldn't have said it. They knew they were walking on thin ice. Six months ago, they would have held their tongue, been polite, political. But what did it matter now? They'd been left behind to die. The general grabbed them by their hair. It had grown out in the six months that they had been on the run, long and unkempt, and forced their head back so they had to look up into her wrinkled, pale face. It startled Nico to realize that she didn't look angry, but petrified. We will find a way, she said sharply, and you will help us. Willingly or not, that will be your choice. What allegiance do you have to the rot on the other side of that wormhole? They left you too, don't forget that. Then she let go of Nico's hair and left the room in four quick strides. The metal door clanged closed behind them, leaving Nico alone in the room once again with a cold, congealed plate of some sort of ganda porridge and a lot to think about. For the next few days, no one came to visit Nico. They existed in the small, unassuming room, repeating the coordinates again and again. The only human contact they had was with the soldier who brought their food every morning, afternoon, and evening. And the soldier must have been given orders not to talk to Nico, because she never did. She looked familiar, but Nico surmised that everyone in the same uniform looked familiar. The Gandesian army couldn't torture Nico, because that would go against Article 731 of the Soldevar Trust. So there was no reason to keep them here. Nico should have been out finding the solar system the Vela disappeared to, instead of sitting here in this 10 by 10 foot room. But no, they were here, trapped. On the fourth day, the door opened halfway into the afternoon and Nico thought that maybe they were getting dessert for once. But when they sat up, they found it was General Sinrig and quickly lay back down again. Your brothers have asked for your safe return. The general began, pulling up a chair again. She sat down, facing Nico's bed, and crossed one leg over the other. So they do care, Nico commented. Of course they do. Family is family whether Gandesian or Kayami or Khwarizmian. But not refugees. The general didn't have an answer for that. Of course she didn't. Nico closed their eyes and waited for her to go. They wanted company, but not her company. And nothing she said was going to change their mind. 47, 36, 4, 372, 990... They repeated the coordinates over and over again in their head, so lost in the numbers, they didn't feel the scurrying across their arm until it was almost at their throat. Then they opened their eyes. A silvery spider sat on their chest. Nico screamed and brushed away the mechanical spider, scrambling to sit up. They had forgotten about Sinrig spiders. After everything that had happened, they had forgotten one of the worst parts about her. The general held one in her hand, and it walked across her fingers back and forth, back and forth. It's a pity, really, she went on. They even said they wanted to negotiate with us for your release. Isn't that something? My brothers would never negotiate, unless it's for you, apparently, Sinrig mused. But you know I can't negotiate until I get what I want. Which you won't get. Nico eyed the spider on her hand hesitantly. They had to remember that Sinrig couldn't torture them. It was against the trust. This was just a scare tactic. One that wouldn't work. Besides, what could our little spiders do anyway? A lot. The small voice in the back of Nico's brain replied. I don't have anything anyway, Nico went on, just to sell it. The woman cocked her head. I think you're lying. After she subdued you, my lieutenant found you had destroyed the lab's hard drive. 
Now, why would you do that if not to cover something up? What would I cover up? I don't know. The thumb drive you used was empty, and we couldn't repair the hard drive in the end. So you either found something too precious to copy, or I found nothing, and I destroyed it because I was angry, Nico snapped. I think it's the second one, General. There's nothing. Uzochi left nothing. No blueprints, no instructions, no prototypes, nothing. We're stranded, General, and we're all going to die. The last part made Nico's voice waver, because even with the coordinates, there was still a very good chance of that. Sinrig sat back in her chair. She was silent for a long moment, considering Nico's words. The spider crawled up her arm and perched delicately on her shoulder. Its beady red lens eyes watched Nico unblinkingly. And very faintly, Nico began to hear a sound. They didn't understand what it was at first. But then they remembered the click, click, click of tiny legs scrambling across a metal floor. They stiffened, ready to bolt out of bed, but it was too late. General Sinrig fixed them with her icy gaze. I don't believe you. Spiders poured out from the crack between the wall and the bed and rushed up their body, crawling, clicking, digging their sharp feet into their skin. Nico tried to brush them off, but as they did, more came, grinding, biting, scratching, until they covered every inch of their skin. Nico fell over onto the bed, paralyzed, until the spiders swarmed over their eyes and blocked out the light, too. The last thing they saw was the general smirking over them, as if she had won. And that was all there was. The click of metal and the chattering of tiny mandibles and darkness. They couldn't move. They could barely breathe. And everything was dark, so dark dark like the nothingness of space, like the pinpoint of the universe where their father's ship had been, and suddenly not, the kind of darkness that haunted their nightmares. The spiders encased Nico in a cocoon of metal bodies, and there Nico existed. For how long? They didn't know. But they felt warm lips press against their ear, and the hot breath of General Sinrig hushed across their cheek. You will tell me what you know, but you will understand why you should fear me first. Then nothing, 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 nothing but the numbers in their heads. Breathe. Think. Remember the numbers. In order. 47, 36, 4, 300, 72, 990. And the rest. All 123 numbers over and over again. In the dark. But the thoughts began to creep into their head. Why did Asala leave me? Why did she kill my father? Why didn't she kill me too? And then worst of all, why am I always left behind? Left behind by Asala, who disappeared through the wormhole and left by their father, gone to some other place through a rift where they cannot follow. Left by everyone they ever cared about. Everyone they let into their lives. Left by their brothers, who went on to marry or join the Kayami military. Leave the guilty behind, Nico had once said to Asala. And so they were. The truth was, they had come to terms with dying on a frozen planet. They knew they would, either of the weather or dehydration or malnourishment. They would watch the sun blink out... And then that would be that. The cold would come. The cold came for everyone in the end anyway. 
That wasn't why Nico searched for the last six months to find some way through the wormhole after the Vela. They searched because they wanted an answer. They wanted to face Asala and ask, Why did you leave me behind? And Nico knew out of everyone who had left, Asala would be the only one who respected them enough to give them a true answer. After Nico got their answer, they weren't sure what they would do. Maybe destroy that sun too. Maybe make it so no one could be left behind again because there wasn't another way to go forward. You couldn't be left behind if there was no future to fight for after all. That was the cruel, twisting part of Nico they didn't want to admit was there. It had been festering since their father died and over the last six months had only grown into a ravenous thing deep inside of them. It wanted to see Asala suffer. It wanted to make Asala pay. Which was why they had to survive this darkness. They had to remember the coordinates. They had to face Asala again and ask that question. And watch the hope bleed from her eyes as they ripped her future away from her. And in the darkness, that ravenous, deep-pitted monster smiled. You're listening to The Vela Salvation by Ashley Poston, starring Robin Miles. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. The Vela Salvation is written by Ashley Poston, Maura Milan, Nicole Givens Kurtz, and Sangu Mandana. It is produced by Rhoda Bilyeza and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith. <laughs>